I survived the Collinswood Massacre by Random Appellation 468. A shudder broke me from my sleep. Yawning, I rolled over and pushed some of the long brown hair from my face. Meg's living room lay blanketed in shadow, cool and dry with the aid of her family's air conditioning unit. My house hadn't had working AC for years, and while I'd gotten used to sleeping in the hot Ohio summers, sometimes it felt nice to go to bed fresh and wake up the same way. A small green light from Kate's phone charger cast a dim glow over the room. She'd curled up in her blue sleeping bag on the floor, with Meg draped over a nearby couch. And Lena snored softly from her under her blanket on the coffee-colored recliner. Our unfinished game of Monopoly sat on the coffee table along with the scattered ship bags, half-empty soda cans, and Kate's left shoe from where we'd gotten into a shoe-throwing war and had almost broken a window. The smell of burned popcorn lingered from Lena's grand inability to follow the instructions on the bag, and I realized from the sugary taste on the back of my tongue that I'd neglected to brush my teeth before falling asleep. Still, despite the chaos, the scene felt homey. Tranquil, even, as it always had whenever Meg invited us over for a sleepover at her parents' house. From where I reclined on the other couch, I smiled at various DVD cases Meg dug out for us. All the original Star Wars movies, along with Ender's Game and The Martian. A group favorite. I'm friends with a bunch of nerds. It hit me again. A barely perceivable tremor that seemed to emanate from somewhere under the plush couch. And for a second... I thought it might be Meg's cat, Bruno. Boom. A few of the glass panes in the DVD cabinet rattled and a faint shockwave rippled up from the floor into my chest. The concussive rumble echoed from somewhere further away outside the living room window, and through the shuttered blinds I caught the smallest flash of light. Wow. I didn't think I'd call for rain. Must have been a big lightning bolt to shake the ground like... Boom, boom, boom. Something about the way the sounds roared closer and closer with each successive blast made my blood run cold. That didn't sound like lightning. In fact, it reminded me more of fireworks than anything else, but deeper, more, more baritone, with a spine-tingling amount of force behind each one. I slid my legs out from under the fuzzy Han Solo blanket Meg loaned me and padded over to the nearest window to pry one of the shades aside. Quiet banks of puffy white fall greeted my eye and the old-fashioned wrought iron street lamps glowed like stars among the twisting, humid clouds. Houses lined the empty asphalt streets, interspersed with neatly kept lawns and motionless wind chimes suspended from their freshly painted front porches. Wonder how much that cost. I eyed a beautiful house painted silver-gray with gold and white accents, topped by a round, turreted window that reminded me of a fairy tale castle. I couldn't afford the doorknob on that place. Even for such a small and rural place as Barron County, Ohio, there were poor and rich areas. Most of the wealthier and middle-class families tended to either live in the county's largest and only city, Black Oak, or on private land in the countryside. For the low-income families, we couldn't afford land payments or higher rent. We eked out a living in the smaller town of Collinswood, on the opposite end of the county. When the other well-to-do families started to move out due to falling property values, Meg's father stayed. As the owner of the county's second-largest sawmill, he'd driven all around town with his wife, Clara, to donate tools, materials, and even help with repairs for people from all walks of life. It was mostly thanks to Travis Ralston that Collinswood was in a run-down shantytown. Through our prissy mayor, Gloria Saristi, would never admit that her taxpayer-funded social programs had been outshone by what she referred to as a wood-cutting hillbilly. Travis treated all us girls like his own daughters, since we could walk, and Clara had surprised us with pizza for the sleepover. Even though we were all 18, Kate and I working our own part-time jobs already. My eyebrows hitched higher in my face and frowned at the sound of several police sirens flaring to life in the distance. A reddish glow hung over the dark horizon to the west, and as I stood by the window, I could just pick up more pops and cracks further out. Collins Wood had its share of problems, mostly drugs and the occasional domestic abuser, but it was rare to hear sirens at night. It was even rarer still to hear so many gunshots, even in a county so pro-gun. 
that they sold shotgun shells in the general store next to the potato chips and hot dog buns. A flash lit up the town's sleepy skyline and I saw the shockwave slither through the air. Boom. This one shook the house with violent force and I stumbled back from the window to trip over the steering Kate. Her phone charger's light flickered out and on the streets outside all the street lights went dark at the same time. How? Kate shoved me off her legs in irritation. Gee, Sarah, where's the fire? I didn't say anything. My head cocked to the, le to the side as I listened. Every neighborhood dog began to bark up a storm, the world outside much darker than it had been ten minutes ago, with only the thin rays of moonlight shining through the gaps in the window shades. Somewhere in the murky streets, I caught a strange screech thumping sound that reminded me of the steel mill my uncle worked at in Pennsylvania, a heavy repetitive thud that didn't fit in with any of the normal sounds a tiny farming town made at night. Swallowing, I suppressed a shiver and rubbed at the goosebumps on my arm. It's almost like footsteps. Meg sat up on the couch and rubbed her eyes. Uh, shut the TV off. It's three in the frickin' morning. Meg. I shuffled backward on my feet and every impulse in my body quivered. Something's wrong. Seriously, guys, get up. Something's happening. A beam of bright blue light shot out from the dark hallway and Clara darted into view. A flashlight in one bony hand. Her tired eyes wide with Muted panic. Up, everyone, get up now. But, Mom, we... Wham! Meg never got to com finish her complaint as the echo of the front door slamming reached our ears and heavy boots thumped on the kitchen floor. Clara lunged to put herself between the opposite hallway and us, her free hand balled in a trembling fist. Meg's mother was a gentle, quiet woman, and to see her acting like someone, co some cornered mother bear, defending her young son chills down my spine. Am I having a bad dream? How many flaming hot Cheetos did I eat? A lumbering shadow emerged and a blood-covered hand pressed flat against one wall. Meg recoiled on the couch. Kate and I backed up to the opposite side of the room and Lena ducked behind the sofa I'd been sleeping on. Clara took a frightened step back but raised her arm to swing with a white-knuckled fist. It's me! Clara, it's me! From the darkness came a red and black flannel shirt soaked with fresh blood, along with a pair of old blue jeans spoiled in a similar fashion. Both muscled arms were coated in red and black spatters and a gore-smeared hunting knife trembled in the left hand. Many of the stains on the shirt resembled handprints, some red, some a weird clotted black, and above the bushy salt and pepper beard, Travis's dark eyes seemed to stare through his wife in a weary, stunned gaze. Are you okay? Clara shuffled close to hug him. But Travis waved her off with his free hand. I'm all right. None of it's mine. Get the girls and put as much food into bags as you can. Dad? Meg frowned. Her brow furrowed over her crossed arms. Come on, is this some sort of... Just do as I say. He growled, Travis's dark eyes flashing with a ferocity that startled me. Get the food and stay away from the windows. The other girls stared at him. But something in his tone set off an alarm in the back of my brain, and I moved the, to jerk the shade at the window closed. I grew up on the poor side of town, born into a family of factory workers and house cleaners, but mom and dad had been worried about preparedness ever since the pandemic started spreading a few years ago. They couldn't afford to stockpile much in ways of supplies, but mom drilled all kinds of lessons into my head about what to do when it was time to leave town in a hurry. Water, food, clothes, and run like heck. Shaking my head to Clear the sleepiness away, I stumbled out my overnight bag to yank on a set of blue jeans instead of my silky shorts. It wasn't the time to be squeamish about this sort of thing, and I doubted Travis or Clara would be appalled at me about me changing in their living room, when Travis looked like he'd just butchered a deer with his shirt buttons. Meg groaned in annoyance beside me, a squeaky fear in her voice giving way to a pouty whine. This better not be another stupid tornado drill. I swear Mayor Saristi has the worst time. A low throbbing roar thundered just overhead and I peeked between the shades to see a gray helicopter swoop low across the sky, a powerful white searchlight probing at the streets below. Attention, attention, this is an emergency broadcast, please remain calm. With all the emotion of a broken alarm clock, an artificial female voice droned from some loudspeaker mounted to the circling helicopter, backlit by the flickers of more booms in the distance. All citizens report to the city center for evacuation immediately. This is not a drill. 
Do not attempt to shelter in place. Do not approach any individuals who may act erratic. Do not look up at light, bright lights above you. Please move in an orderly fashion to prevent accidents. Have your personal ID ready at the designated lo loading area. Attention. Attention. Ice pounded through my veins and I forced myself to breathe slow, my heart racing. This was real. This was really happening. After all the talk to my, about my parents, all the tinfoil hat videos they'd shown showed me from the internet, all the books written by men convinced the end was nigh. Here it was. Is it the Ru Russians? Did they finally launch? Are we at war? I want to go home. Lena sat on the carpet and pulled her knees to her chest, sim seeming to revert to a six-year-old under her, the weight of the crushing fear that hung in the air all around us. It's got to be a prank, right? Kate made a half giggle of nervousness, even as she too yanked on her on sweatpants and a different t-shirt. Just hurry up! Clara sped around the room to gather photo albums, candles, and matches into a suitcase. Travis disappeared into the kitchen, where the sound of food cans tumbling into a bag echoed after him. Meg moved in a daze, staring at her hands like she couldn't believe her own eyes and ears. I felt bad for her. She'd grown up in a nice house with everything she could ever want, and two loving parents who raised her into a rather decent human being. For her, this was unimaginable. For me, I counted the seconds with bated breath as we dove into the inky black kitchen where Travis and Clara stuffed our bags with water bottles, canned food, and pill bottles from the medicine cabinet. How long did it take a nuclear missile to reach its target? Were we within the blast range? Shouldn't we take cover? If it's a nuclear attack, then why is Travis covered in bloody handprints? Pushing such horrific logic from my mind, I hefted the strap of my teal duffel higher on one shoulder and focused on pulling my hair into a ponytail to keep it out of my face. Bang! Crash! Screams echoed from somewhere down the street, gunshots ringing out within a few blocks. I could recognize the deafening bark of shotguns, pistols, and rifles spitting lead into the night. That wasn't normal. It was illegal to fire a gun in town, and the sound of breaking glass meant that the bullets weren't flying at backyard targets or into the air in some reckless form of celebration. There's something out there. I whispered aloud, more to myself than anyone else. Thud. We all froze at the sound of dense material smacking into the locked front door. The fancy brass knob jiggled and a soft tick, tick, tick reached my ears like tiny drum beats. No. Not drum beats. Fingernails. The sporadic tapping of untrimmed fingernails on the door. Travis stepped out of the dark again, this time with an M1 carbine clamped in his shaking hands. The muscle pointed toward the noises. His eyes glowed with a contagious primal fear, and he held up a finger to his lips, pointing to the door that led to their attached garage. Get to the truck. Even Meg didn't protest as Clara shoved us through the kitchen, casting furtive glances back at her husband. Thud. 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 Whatever was on the other side of the front door hurled itself against the oaken boards, the planks creaking under the assault. Go! Go now! Travis shuffled, shoved me into the garage with the others and jammed the door shut behind him. On the other side, the muffled groan of collapsing wood sent prickles of dread through me, and I tasted acid in my throat. I climbed into the back seat of the crew cab pickup truck and tried to ignore the growing clap-clap of bare feet on linoleum in the kitchen. Something moving through the house toward us on all fours. No. Make that multiple somethings. Even the panic whispers of my friend and the creaking truck doors couldn't hide the grunted breaths, the low chittering coos, clicks and croaks that made my skin crawl in the dark. Start the engine. Start the engine. Start the freaking engine. I huddled next to Lena. Kate and Meg slouched on the other side of her, and Travis cranked the truck's engine to life. Clara muttered low prayers under her breath, her pale hands fumbling with the seatbelt buckle at her hip. The door to the garage slid upward behind us with a low trundle of its electric motor, and the bright LED headlights clicked on. Despite the blinding flash, I stared as the door I'd ran through slowly swung open. Grimy fingers curled around the edge of the white painted pine. The fingernails chipped. The skin, so pale it almost appeared gray. A matted, greasy head of dark hair poked around the corner at knee height, as if the thing had scuttled on all fours. Through the kitchen, and a pair of milk-white eyes gleamed back at me. A smile 
broad and laced with an eerie delight, rippled across the creature's face, revealing row after row of square, peg-shaped brown teeth. What is that? Meg squeaked, pawing at the back of her father's seat for answers. Dad, what is that? Dad. Travis threw the truck in a reverse, and the vehicle flew into the fog. A blur of gray limbs leaped through the garage as we sped away, several vaguely human shapes bounding across the dark lawn on all fours, with big, wide grins. Crammed into the back seat of the pickup, I could only stare out at the shadows in stunned horror, unable to move or scream. This, this isn't real. How, how is this real? People flooded from their homes, some pulling out in cars and trucks like us, others running on foot, with more than a few being pursued by the crawling nightmares. White-eyed figures surged from the northwestern side of town, through streets, alleyways, and yards, jumping at people whenever they got close. They bit, clawed, and tore their victims apart like ravenous dogs, throwing chunks of flesh and blood everywhere. The entire world felt as though it had turned upside down in a matter of minutes. But I could only watch with open mouth horror. Oh my gosh! Clara stared up through the windshield, her eyes wide as saucers at whatever had emitted the loud electro synth foghorn blast. Don't look! Baby, don't look at it! Travis floored the accelerator and swerved to avoid hitting a huddle of people that stood frozen in the roadway, their eyes on the sky in rigid fear. More strange foghorns blared through the misty air, and I'd be a beam of white light slid across the asphalt just down the street. The eerie metallic screech thumbs I'd heard earlier clanked above the din, and a huge shadow moved in the low fog that hung over the tops of the houses, angular and vaguely insectoid. Travis, where do we go? C Clara clung to her overhead handle for support as Travis drove. Like a bat out of heck. Our wide eyes fixed on the hexscape outside. Where are we supposed to go? To the governor has soldiers near the courthouse. Travis gritted his teeth and plowed through a handful of the wide-eyed freaks, their bodies crunching with a strange wooden density against the underside of the pickup. Look, get us out. Just don't look at the lights. What's making those sounds? Lena slouched lower in her seat, shaking so hard she could have had hypothermia and no one would have known the difference. There's something behind us, Kate's shout caused my eardrum to ring, and I screwed both, screwed both eyes shut to clap my hands over them. Crash! In the road ahead, a red Buick crumpled under an enormous piece of vertical steel I-beam that seemed to plummet from nowhere, moving too fast to stop. I had a split second to duck as the rear bumper of the car raced toward our, our radiator. Travis yanked on the steering wheel, and Clara screamed with the shrillness of a tea kettle. Lena went flying over the dash, and Kate's body crushed into mine. Meg's face slammed over the headrest of her father's seat, and tiny blue-green bits of glass sprayed across my field of vision. Rubber screeched, brakes shrieked, and a loud grinding squeal pierced the air as my world lurched to a halt. Beads of broken glass stuck to everything. My clothes, my loose hair, the seat upholstery, and the floor mats. The front windshield was completely gone, only a few jagged shards left around the edges from where it had been. Hot metal and burned tire rubber wafted on the cool breeze. And through my ears, though my ears still rang, I could make out the screams of people running by. My mouth tasted of coppery blood, and my skin had gone numb from all the adrenaline. Stunned, I pushed myself back against the seat from the bent-over position I'd been in and gazed down at my arms and legs in a stupor. I am... I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Nothing feels broken, at least... Not yet. From behind the plume of his deployed airbag, Travis turned to grunt something to me, his forehead bleeding from a nasty cut near his hairline. Flash. Bright light filled the cab, pried into every nook and cranny of my eyesight, and drowned out everything else with his blinding intensity. I couldn't move. Couldn't breathe, transfixed by some unseen hand that forced me to stay still and beckoned from deep inside the aura. Something tickled at the base of my ringing eardrum, soft and subtle. Whispers. So many whispers like tendrils of cold tickling my, my consciousness. They echoed all around me, some close, some far, but with different voices. 
the words indistinguishable. I couldn't tell if they were happy or sad, pained or excited. They just persisted a wave of disembodied humanity, calling to each other through the void. Look for the light. Instinct shouted at me to move, to shut my eyes, to run. But I couldn't. I seemed to be held back by a separate, sludgy portion of my brain that didn't want to. I wanted to bathe in the light, to sit here and soak it all in, to feel the warm embrace of the cables as they wound around me. Cables. As if shot by static, my right eye twitched, the cornea stung, and I blinked in reflex. They slithered through the broken windows, greasy braided steel cables moving on their own like snakes to wrap around my ankles and slide up the legs, arms, and torsos of the others in the truck. Travis, Clara, Meg, and Kate sat still as statues with eyes wide and unblinking, their faces glowing in the aura of the light. The source of the light hovered right outside the pickup truck, a spotlight so powerful I could barely keep my eyes shielded with one hand. My heart roared, the whispers turned to dizzying static inside my skull, and I fought the urge to vomit. I forced my rubbery arms to move and clawed at the nearby door handle. Run. I need to run. The handle clicked and I threw the truck door open, kicking at the icy cables, latched them around my ankles with panic. They seemed to be surprised at my resistance and slackened enough for me to wriggle with, wriggle free. With a yelp, I tumbled to the wet asphalt and skittered away from the light on my hands and knees. The beam shifted pivoted to follow me as I fled, and a deafening electro-synth roar slammed into me like a hurricane of sound. My head pounded, every limb shook like a leaf, but I made myself crawl as fast as I could. A hard pavement scraping into my bare palms. I didn't know what stood behind me or where it had come from, but deep within my mind I knew that the light wasn't as good as it wanted me to believe. It wasn't true light, like sunlight, candlelight, or even starlight. It was fake, mechanical, a synthetic lure to bait for our kind and like moths to a flame. Cool grass swished under my hands, a yard greeting me with a picket fence and nearby house. All I had to do was hop the fence and sprint for the town center. Sucking in deep gasps of fog-tinged air to clear my head, I tried to push myself up to run. Almost there. Vice-like fingers locked around my left shoe, and I twisted onto my side in an effort to squirm free. Sarah! Kate clung to my leg in desperation, even as a set of grimy cables wound around her feet to drag her backward. Help me! More screams emanated from the pickup truck, and I turned to see the cables slashing and writhing inside it with violence, spraying thick coats of red viscera across the cracked back window. Travis groaned in agony. Meg's cry hit a shrill passion. Clara gurgled as if her lungs were filled with water. Something shredded them, eviscerated them alive, and the mass of swirling steel led to a looming shadow high above the surrounding banks of fog. For the first time that night, I looked up. It stood, hunched over the wrecked truck, with eight steel legs planted on either side of the street. They were made of I-beams, with more cables of various sizes running up and down the legs like vines. These led to a strange spinal column that seemed to be all sorts of steel fused together, ending in a wide satellite dish for a head. Ring with the bright white lights I'd seen and shaken loose from earlier. A lone siren hung bolted just under the dish and beneath that. A tangle of anemone. Like cables moved with independent ease, grabbing at everything human that could, they could reach. The grease on the cables was blood, I realized. Congealing chunks of flesh, blood and organs from previous victims. Many of whom swung limply underneath the belly of the monstrosity like gallows victims. Spinning myself around on the grass edge of the lawn, I scrambled back over to Kate and pulled hard on her sweaty hands. I have to get her loose. Kick! I gritted my teeth and leaned backward with all my might. The soles of my shoe was sliding on the damp ground. Kate, fight it! I can't pull you! She screamed and thrashed, the cables gripping tighter and tighter by the second. My shoes slipped on the asphalt and I, I went down. The two of us dragged slowly toward the truck over the tarmac. My pulse throbbed in both temples, and I struggled to grip Kate's hands, keeping my head craned away from the creature so the light wouldn't get me a second time. A line of nearby bricks from the old section of sidewalk caught my eye, and my heart leaped. Stretching out one arm, I strained, the tips of my fingers brushing the nearest one, the red brick rocking loosely in the decrepit spot in the corner. Old mortar crumbled around it, so close, yet so far. Kate's hand slipped from my grasp, and she shrieked clawing at the grounded vein. No. 
I snatched up the brick and threw myself to my feet, both legs unstable jelly underneath me. Staggering over the painted lines in the road, I raised the brick high and brought it down as hard as I could. Clank. It bounced off the cables with a predictable impotency, not leaving as much as so much as a dent. But the serpentine bits of steel recoiled at the attack, and Kate jerked her feet away. I wound my fingers into the collar of her t-shirt and half dragged her, the light swinging back toward me once again. Come on! I limped Kate through the yard, the two of us diving through the garden gate to avoid another sweeping beam of white. More screams rang in the dark and the light didn't follow, as if the enormous metal spider decided to hunt easier prey in the chaotic street. In the dark shadows of the backyard, Kate and I slid to the ground behind a small garden shed and gasped for air. My stomach threatened to overpower me, and to my right, Kate leaned over to heave up her pizza from dinner. The screech thumbs of the giant machines continued all over town, some in the west, some in the north, others in the south. Only the east stayed mostly quiet, with the exception of a few helicopters circling low in that direction. The evacuation, if the east is quiet, that must be safe. We have to head east. You okay? My words rasped hoarse and dry in my throat, but I poked at Kay's shaking shoulders with a pointed finger. No. She arched her back to vomit some more bile onto the grass. They're dead. They're all freaking dead. Tears welled in my eyes and I blinked hard to push them back. Meg had been my friend since the first grade. I said Lena. Travis and Clara were like second parents to me. Now they were gone. Horribly so. Ripped apart in their own truck by... What exactly? Don't. Don't think about it. Just get away. We have to keep moving. I hauled myself up and reached down to pull Kate along with me, some of the dizziness fading from my mind. Can you walk? Kate's legs collapsed under her, and she let out a frustrated, terrified whimper. I feel like I'm going to pass out. Gosh, my head hurts. What? What was that thing? In the darkness, a few yards away, a loud shriek split the night, and I crouched lower, my heart racing. The white-eyed creatures were getting close. Kate, listen to me. I hissed, trying to listen for signs of movement in the next grassy lot over, the skinny, white-painted privacy fence all that stood between us, and the terrible unknown. You have to focus, okay? I need you to walk. Breathe deep. Her watery eyes met mine, and Kate sniffled. It... it and if I can't, don't leave me, Sarah, please. Please don't leave me here. Guilt cut through me like a knife. I'd left her once already, I realized, back in the truck. I hadn't checked to see if she'd broken free from the light's hold on her mind. Hadn't gone back to drag her free from the cable's grasps. I'd ran like a rat. Left them all to die. If I'd gone back, could I have saved Meg too, or Travis, or Clara? I hadn't even checked to see when, where Lena had gone. That she was still alive, or smeared all over the pavement like a squished bug. My best friend since forever. And I'd left them all to die. Selfish. A selfish, selfish, useless coward. That's what you are, Sarah McGregor. Kneeling, I hugged my cl friend close and forced down the massive lump that tried to choke me. I won't. I won't, I promise. Just try for me. She sighed and pushed herself off the grass again. This time, her wobbly legs held, and I draped her arm over my shoulders to take some of the weight. Let's take the slow, okay? Block by block. If we can get to the courthouse or the east side, maybe we can get away from all this. Kate took several deep breaths and sniffled hard to regain her composure. My aunt. My aunt lives in Black Oak. She has an apartment there. If we can find a car, she'll let us stay. My mind flashed to my own family in that moment. And it startled me that I hadn't even thought of them until now. Where were my parents? Or my two little brothers? Were they already in the evacuation area? My mother would have died rather than left without me. But with all these manic freaks and the metal spider things walking around, could she or dad have made it this far? Were they even bothered with when Ash and Brian were at stake? No. I couldn't get muddled now. My family was fine, I told myself. They were waiting at the courthouse safe and sound, with dozens of heavily armed soldiers to protect them. They had to be. We wandered out the back gate on the other side of the house, moving through several yards and patios to avoid the carnage. 
Everywhere, people either ran or lay dying, pursued by the white-eyed things and hunted from above by the metal spiders. The air tasted of burned gunpowder and tires, black smoke filling the sky in various directions, and the noise from gunfire, explosions, and circling helicopters was deafening. Dozens of houses burned with bright orange, red, and yellow flames, lighting up the skyline for miles around. The white-eyed freaks kept shrieking with eer eerie glee at the strange foghorn calls of the spiders preceded their massive footfalls. Several of, the, several of the gargantuan machines were silhouetted on the horizon, skittering through the fiery town in a haphazard line, which reminded me of the Imperial War machines from Meg's favorite Star Wars movie. And I laughed at how absurd big metal walkers were. Stupid. I had no idea. Bright lights and roaring gears flared to life just as Kate and I were halfway across the street, and my heart stopped. Metal screeched not far off, but instead of the thumping of huge radio tower legs, I heard a truck door slam in the low, low growl of a diesel engine. Hands up! A gruff voice barked, and I looked up in time to see the barrel of a rifle leveled in my face. Thank God. Don't shoot! I raised the hand that wasn't sp supporting Kate high, and I almost sobbed in relief. Please don't shoot! Four squat Humvees idled in the road, having skidded to a halt right in front of us. They were all painted the same slate gray as the uniforms the soldiers wore and bore long machine guns on the turrets that the gunners manned with twitching fingers, their eyes on the alleyways and rooftops. I'd seen them before in the outer roads at around Barron County in the past few weeks. The local papers had claimed they were federal consultants for the county sheriff to help with cleanup due to some industrial accident over at the new wilderness wildlife reserve i thought nothing of the rumors that they were here to cover up some strange going was on in the countryside but now that the men glared at me over the holographic sights of their battle rifles i couldn't help but put two and two together they're monsters they're here for the monsters castle this is the stalker three actual we've got unarmed civilians on the west side needing evac permission to load them over at a gruff Australian accent, the man with a ranger's lead the way tattoo in his lower arm clicked the talk button on his radio mic. I didn't dare move closer, not with the machine gunner aiming his bulky weapon right at my chest. From inside the Humvee, whose door still hung open, I heard the radio crackle and subdued versions of it rang in the earpieces of all the men nearby. Stalker 3 Actual, this is Castle. Negative on the civvies. We already are already over capacity. Break contact with the enemy and withdraw to rally point 14 over. From behind his bushy beard, I could still see the man's frown. His eyes narrowing into angry, angry slits. Castle, I say again. I've got two unarmed civilians here that need evoc. They're boy kids, sir. I can't just leave them here over. Kate's eyes met mine, and we both looked over our shoulder at the relatively abandoned side street behind us. A shadow on a nearby alleyway showed something creeping on all fours, with long matted hair hanging low. If they left us, we were as good as dead. My mind swirled with all sorts of things, desperate ideas on what to do. I considered everything from charging the men to begging on my knees, anything to get to safety. Never in my life had I felt more helpless. Stalker 3 Actual, uh, I say again, you are ordered to withdraw to Rally Point 14. Prime Mark is on standby to carry out the clean sweep protocol in 10 mics. You've done all you can. Now get your men out of there. Sergeant. Castle out. The soldier lowered his hand from the radio mic and stared at Kate and I for a few moments. Oh no. Please. I half sobbed, shaking my head at the inevitable. Please, we don't need much. Just take us with you, please. He stalked forward, both dark eyes fixed on me. The rifle gripped in one hand. Atop the truck, the gunner squinted down his sights, and I understood now that there would be no escape. I would never see my family again. My goofy friends who'd, who I'd laughed with, giggled about cute boys with, and complained about schoolwork with, would never be remembered. It would end in a hail of gunfire, like we'd never been there in the first place. All because we saw things we weren't supposed to see. The man slid his arm under Kate's older shoulder and nodded at the Humvee. Come on, Kate, get in. Kate blinked at him and I almost fell over in shock. Wait, for real? Ozzy, we gotta move, man. The machine gunner called down from his perch in the truck turret in a deep south drawl. 
as more shrieks echoed closer to the fog in the foggy streets. These freaks are all over the place. So keep your eyes open, Tex, Ozzy retorted and helped Kate to the rear driver's side door, yanking it open, yanking it open to let us climb into the cool, dark interior of the armored truck. A middle-aged woman and two small children, a boy and a girl, huddled on the opposite side. Their eyes, hair, and clothes a mess with black and red handprints. An elderly couple sat atop the differential cover between the seats and in the space be behind the back seats. I could see eyes and faces peering from the rear cargo area, as if the men had been picking up every straggler for the last three blocks. The driver, a stoic man with a curly beard and mahogany skin, looked on with casual indifference, his voice tinged in a Jamaican tilt. Corporate will lose their minds if they find out we got civvies on board. I can suck a big viney one. Ozzy shut our door and walked around to climb into the passenger side front seat. He threw a glance back at Kate and I, his fierce expression softening into something kinder that reminded me of my father. I got a sister her age back in Melbourne. I'm not leaving them out there just because some suit wants to play God. The driver smiled a pearly white grin and shifted the truck into drive. Softy. Ozzy snatched at the truck's radio and nodded to his driver. All Stalker 3 units, this is Stalker 3 Actual. We are Oscar Mike for Rally Point 14. Stay frosty, lads. There's still a lot of skinnies out there. Stalker 3, 1, out. The convoy jolted back into motion, driving at breakneck speed down the road. Way. In his gun turret, Tex called out targets as he saw them, his beefy weapon chattering into the night as we careened through packs of scattered white-eyed freaks and swerved around another metal spider. Kate broke down into a silent cascade of tears, and I forced myself to breathe slow, even as the tension in my chest ratcheted up to a hundred. The further we got from the center of town, the more military vehicles began to show up in the outer roads, alleyways, and streets, everything from Humvees to full-sized tanks. I noticed that many bore smoking purple-red weapons, as if they'd been firing non-stop for hours, and there were splashes of gore on more than one of them. Handprints a common theme. Overhead, the helicopter swooped away toward the nearby hills, like birds who know there's a storm coming. All units, this is Titan. Be advised. Clean sweep is a go for Sector 5. All necessary coordinates will be relayed to Primark. Time to splash is three mics. Withdraw the outer perimeter and stand by. Titan out. At the deep voice booming from the radio, the driver and Ozzy shared a serious frown. Mon, that's some heavy arty they're bringing in. The Jamaican driver wove through someone's lawn to avoid a bottleneck of wrecked cars that blocked the street. Did the central evac make it out? My clue might. Ozzy scratched his beard, bearded chin and cast a nervous glance toward the burning horizon. My guess is those new wilderness blokes are pushing way more organics and technos than our IRS boys thought. Never thought they'd flush a whole herd of them down on us like this. Right on top of their own people. I sat up, not wanting to give away that I was listening, even as we rolled by columns of fleeting trucks, tanks, and armored cars. I'd been to New Wilderness once or twice before. It was just a quaint little wildlife reserve with exotic animals and fenced in grasslands and a gorgeous campus sitting atop a nice high ridgeline. I remembered having a mild crush on one of the tour guides a year ago, though I never had the courage to ask him for his number, being only 17 and shy as a mouse at the time of my visit. What did the kind, smiling staff at the park know about these creatures? Why hadn't they said anything? More importantly, why would they drive them straight into our homes? As if on cue, the radio crackled to life with the chillingly calm voices of men I didn't know. Bromark, this is Titan. Requesting fire mission. Over. Ozzy swore and glanced out his window at a rearview mirror. Rocco, punch it now. Rocco jammed his foot on the gas, and the Humvee roared into a dead sprint down the last route road out of Collinswood, the others following as everything with wheels made a desperate dash for Route 142. Outside, hordes of panicked townsfolk ran or limped in droves out of town. Swarms of civilian vehicles clogged the road, and many military trucks simply swung around them to drive in the grass. People waved, cried, and pleaded for us to stop, but no one so much as slowed down. All the while, the voices of doom droned on over the radio, and though I didn't quite understand every bit of what they were saying, I knew enough to make me shudder with imminent dread. 
Titan. This is Primark battery of 12 M270A2s, 144HE warheads, standing by for a fire mission. Over. Reaching back to jerk on the pant legs of Tex in his gun turret. Ozzy shouted above the rumble of the diesel engine. Tex, wave at those gunners and tell them to get their hatches closed. We've got big ordnance coming in. Kate began to hyperventilate and I squeezed my arm. So horror. I thought I'd, she'd snap it. My, my parents. Oh gosh, my parents. They're still back there. Sarah, I, I know they are. Opened my mouth to say something encouraging, but the radio drowned me out. Fire mission. Grid. JS-917985. 12 guns all round. Thermo bar. Bark. Delay in effect. Target number CRB2598. Over. Primark copies. All. Oh. Message to observer, grid, JS-917985, 12 guns all rounds, thermobaric, delay in effect. Target number, CRB2598, splash in 10 seconds. Cover! Sliding his bulletproof window down for a few precious moments, Ozzy leaned his reddened face out to scream at the multitude of walking civilians that we rolled past. Get onto something, take cover, take cover now! One of the kids in the back seat started crying at the top of his lungs and from inside the truck cargo area of the Humvee. I could hear more people sobbing, whispering, a few praying in loud, wavering begs to whoever might be listening. The road sloped upward as the convoy climbed through the tangled mass of traffic-jammed civilian cars to reach a hill overlooking Collinswood. And I could see the fire-lit streets below. The homes engulfed in flames, the wrecked cars, and three of the steel spiders still rampaging through the east side of town with fury. My house is down there. My room, my computer, my fam... No, they're not still there. They're not. They're somewhere safe. They all are. I gripped Kate in a tight embrace to keep her from looking, but made myself stare out the dirty bulletproof glass, needing to see it for myself. Shot over. Somewhere, far over the distance... Distant horizon to the north, the sky lit up with a kaleidoscope of flashing white lights and streaks of fire soared into the sky. Dozens upon dozens like shooting stars. Shot out! Cade wailed into my shoulder, and Ozzy slammed his window shut, crossing himself in the Catholic way over and over again. Kaboom! All the rockets came down at once, exploding so close together that the cacophony molded into one enormous eruption. The world lit up bright as daylight, and for a split second, I could see everything around me with perfect clarity. I saw the church where I'd performed an Easter play when I was little. I saw the tiny high school I'd always called the prison. I saw the neighborhood where my house was. Out of instinct, I shut my eyes, but not soon enough that I didn't get a snapshot of it imprinted into my mind forever. The shockwave rocked the truck a few seconds after the flash and everything in Collins were turned to fiery dust. Buildings were incinerated, cars thrown into the air, and trees caught on a fire a quarter mile out from the town center. The courthouse, surrounded by cars and a heavy shadow that must have been people, crumbled like it was made of Lego blocks. Heat licked at my face, even though the closed, bulletproof window as a very era caught fire. With one great hateful roar, the battle between man and monster reached a crescendo in Collinswood. And then... Silence. I opened my eyes to see a crater the size of a small town burning with hackish intensity. Some flames as tall as a three-story building. Thick black smoke blotted out the stars, and car alarms went off from every civilian car on the road beside us. But compared to what had been, the screams, the horns, gunshots, and shrieks, the night was quiet now. Deadly quiet. Once more, the radio sounded its mournful tone. Primark, this is Titan. Good effect on target. BDA is 100 over 100. Tighten out. Putting my head down alongside Kate's, I screwed my eyes shut and sobbed. Because I knew then, in my heart, that she was right. My family was still down there. 
Hey guys, and thank you so much for watching today's story. If you did enjoy, please feel free to leave a like as it does help the channel numerally and does get the gospel into people's feeds as well as consider subscribing as we are trying to hit a thousand subs by the end of the year. Of course, um, big, big blessing from the Lord if you guys did so. I want to thank you guys so much for the support recently as well as you, Lord. So thank you guys so much and thank you, Lord, for that. Of course, if you haven't done so already, please make sure to repent of your sins and trust in the good Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Read the Holy Bible daily, pray daily, evangelize people, make sure to go in the description or in the pinned comments. Read the million dollar question to know how to become born again. Read the million dollar question. Well, yeah, I just said that. Um, it's important. It'll teach you why you need to repent and trust in Christ. I'm honestly thinking about changing it a little bit. Not the million dollar question, but just saying, like, read the million dollar question because me just telling you to repent and trust in Christ, to be completely honest, some people might just be like, yep, yeah, uh, nope, sorry, bye, and then they'll just dip without giving it much thought because they hear that and they don't understand why. And so, I don't know. I've been talking about that a little bit. Um, you may have noticed a few sound effects in this uh, episode. I hope you did. Uh, both links to those will be in the description. Um, it is police sirens and a awesome little like horn that some guy, I don't know if it's free to use, I hope it is, and I'm gonna link it in the description anyways, so go check those channels out. Um, this one was really good. Kind of sad, though, too, you know? I mean, truly, random Appalachian stories are absolutely amazing, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan. Um, and I can't wait to continue on. But we actually only have a little bit more, y'all. We have one more, kind of, it's a series, but it's only two parts. Um, so it's like a mini-series, kind of. But it is a series, nonetheless. And... Then we have the Mon Jongo series, massive series, a 30-parter from Random Appalachian. And that is one of three books of equally, I believe, 30 parts. Those are not out yet. Um, he just finished writing, or finishing the uh, original book, which I'm very excited to watch and is actually, or to read, and is actually the, um, the whole reason I started doing this, the, the anthology in the first place. I've actually, uh, I was ex I was interested in reading it. It was like seven parts, which is amazing because obviously I do prefer to do series because there is these, those are massive amounts of, uh, it's a lot easier. If I have a series that is like 30 episodes long, that would be this one, you know, I can just be like, okay, there it is, right? 30 episodes long. I have, essentially, I have enough for a month, which is awesome, um, obviously. And then with some of the stuff from 02321, I have two series that I can narrate from him that are uh, massively extreme. And by what I mean by that is they're like 40. Um, two of two separate series. One of which I'm going to start... I'm going to start one first, I think. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe I'll do the one that I think is going to be less in interesting first. Uh, it'll both will be great, but like one of them, the title, draws me in more, which is completely fine. I th I'm sure both of them are fantastic. You don't know who 02321 is? He is the one that made the apartment story. There is something very wrong with my apartment building. If you haven't seen that, um, go check it out. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, I don't know, I guess, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll link that in the description as well, um, for you guys, the playlist that has those in it, but yeah, guys, thanks for watching, I did say something in here, the whole, you suck of any one, you know, that thing, I don't know if I necessarily should have said that, but I don't know, I say that all the time in real life, and I really, I probably shouldn't, but I mean, you know, uh, you know, Probably forgive me if I shouldn't be saying that, but you know, it's in the story, um, and it is a character, so not like he swore or anything. I really struggled to do that Australian accent at the beginning. Good golly gosh, because every time I would say bloody, I would say I would go into I'd be like he's a bloody kid, you know, like I would start doing like an Irish or a Scottish. That was terrible when I just did there the that Scottish or Irish. It's much better normally, but. You know. Anyways, this is getting a little long. We're at uh, 49 minutes, and I'm pretty sure I ended this at like 45. So, yeah, we might have to do two outro songs, being a Lost World and Identity Crisis. It's a long one. This one's almost 50 minutes. This might be my uh, longest story so far. Also, if anybody doesn't know this, which I don't think I've ever talked about it, I do plan to, at some point, uh, combine all the stories together. Um, yeah. Some of them, like the entirety of the Dark, or the, uh, the Barron County Anthology, might be a bit longer of a wait, seeming as they're probably, it's probably like eight or nine hours currently, um, if not longer, and uh, yeah. So, 
and we haven't even hit the major story, the, well, the major expansion, I should say, the 30-parter, which, yeah, it's going to be a massive series. I might have to do it in different parts. I don't know how I can necessarily do that. It feels to me like a computer editing thing. For those of you who don't know, I edit on my phone because that's what I have to use. I don't really know what is a good... If anybody knows great free editors on the computer, because I think this one's fine. Um, it is free, but, you know. Let me know. Let me know. All right. We're at 50 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. Of course, repent, trust in Christ. Read the million dollar question. Join the Discord. I don't know if I said join the Discord. Join the Discord. Link in the description. Check out the streams. I might stream tonight. We'll see. I might also just go ham on videos and start uploading more. You may be saying, well, Hunter, you've talked about uploading a little bit in some of these, or maybe I haven't. I don't know. I'm trying to do one bigger video a day, meaning about 10 minutes. That Those are the bigger videos. But they're unlisted, rather privated, because they're random videos and they're not necessarily that great. They're not up to quality like this one. But obviously I have to get videos out because I'm out of space. I've been out of space for multiple years now because I'm lazy and I actually need to put effort in. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm, I I didn't do one last night because I fell asleep. Um, but yeah. I love you. See you later. Do all those things. Uh, again, sound effects links in the description. And um, the... I'm pretty sure I'm using a specific one that I don't know is free, but maybe I'll switch it. I don't know necessarily know if I'm going to, because I really like this one. It's really good. It gives some eeriness, and I really hope it works, but I digress. Anyways, I love y'all. Read the million-dollar question. Pantrose Christ. And I'll see y'all later. But as always, this is Ninja Gamer. Signing off.